Welcome back to the final session of JLF Colorado 2021. On behalf of Amit Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjay Roy, Jesse Fredman, and all my colleagues at JLF Colorado, Team Bacards, Boulder Public Library, and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to this session of JLF Colorado 2021 Virtual Festival. The multitude that we are, readings and conversation. Usha Akila, Manuel Munoz, Susie Q. Smith, in conversation with Aruni Kashya. A session that examines the multitudes of identities, be it ethnic or gendered, that add to the rich diversity of the literary universe. Introducing our speakers for today, Usha Akila. Usha Akila has authored nine books that include poetry, one chapbook, and two musical dramas. Her latest poetry book is I Will Not Be a Use Sans. She earned an MST, a MST in creative writing from the University of Cambridge, UK. She's the founder of Matwala, the first diaspora poetry festival and collective and www.the-pov.com, a website of curated interviews. Manuel's first novel, What You See in the Dark, was published by Algon Quinn, Books of Chapel Hills in 2011. A recipient of Writing uh, Writers Award in 2008, he was a finalist for the 2007 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Prize and has been included in the Penguin Book of the Modern American Short Story, the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature, and the Heath Anthology of American Literature. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Freeman's, Epoch, Glimmer Train, American Short Fiction, Boston Review, and has aired on selected shorts. He's currently an associate professor at the University of Arizona, Tucson. Susie Q. Smith is an award-winning artist, activist, and educator who lives in Denver, Colorado. A collection of poems, A Gospel of Bones, is available from Alternating Current Press, and a second collection, Poems for the End of the World, is available from Finishing Line Press. In conversation with Aruni Kashyap. Aruni writes in two languages, English and his native language, Assamese. He is the author of three books of fiction and a winner of the Charles Wallace India Trust Scholarship for creative writing to the University of Edinburgh. He's an assistant professor of, of creative writing at the University of Georgia, Athens, an editor at large with the Southern Review of Books and served as a jury member for the 2021 JCB Prize for Indian Literature. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on upcoming sessions. In these difficult times, we have struggled to bring you JLF Colorado 2021 without charging a registration fee. Please support as generously as you can to ensure a free, seamless and continuous flow of information and knowledge. Simply click on the support JLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting The Multitude That We Are, Readings and Conversation. Usha Akela, Manuel Munoz, Munoz, Susie Q. Smith in conversation with Aruni Kasha. Aruni, over to you. Thank you, Suraj, for that lovely introduction. It's really my privilege and honor to uh, meet the three writers of this panel today, Manuel Munoz, Usha Akela, and Suji Q. Smith. Um, I, I'm, I'm really in awe of the work that you have done, and, uh, and I didn't have a lot of time to read, actually, um, some of your work because I just concentrated to do this uh, uh, very, very late. But I have um, read Manuel's work long ago when I was an undergraduate. That's a completely different story. And so I was very excited to actually uh, meet you, Manuel. And I was equally excited to read Usha. I read Usha's poems one or two, but today I had the, after lunch, I had a marathon reading session and, and, and read most of your poetry collection. And Suji, so, I was reading obviously because you sent the PDF. Both of you sent the PDF earlier. But anyway, so I'm in the middle of the semester, just like I think Manuel and busy with teaching um, and all the all the conversations around mask and the virus but but this is such a wonderful way to spend the evening um i'm not going to uh, take a lot of time um, talking about um, uh, each of your work because it's been a wonderful introduction all i'm going to say is that that, that video in the audio visual really missed me made me miss boulder colorado which is so beautiful a city where the jlf happens and i hope we will get to get together uh in 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 a physical location very soon when the world heals but i think literature and poetry especially poetry you know even though i'm a prose writer especially poetry i think has a unique power to heal the world and i i hope it will provide some kind of comfort and some kind of healing to anybody who is listening to this conversation today um i really sort of made a uh, I wanted Manuel to be in the middle, sandwiched by the two poets. So I'm going to uh, let his reading be in the middle. And I quickly just thought whose reading I wanted to sort of, there was, I just, I'm going to ask Suji to actually uh, go and read. So we, 
each of uh, each of the writers and poets, we have seven minutes. You're welcome to contextualize your work also from where you are reading and which poetry collection. And if it is a story or if it is part of a narrative or a larger cycle of poems, you can tell that as well for the readership, readers and, uh, and, 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 and the listeners. And at the end of the reading, so seven, seven by three is 21 minutes. I hope to sort of get into a conversation with you. And after 35 minutes, we will take audience questions. So um, I'm really excited. Suji, would you please go ahead and read? Um, I don't have very special requests, but I really was moved by how to make love and especially the poem uh, uh, on, 20, on 2020, you know, uh, on, on the illness and the virus. Uh, and I, I think I emailed you about that as well. But you are, you are free to read your favorite war. But I just said that those are the two poems that especially stood out for me. Well, thank you very, very much for that beautiful introduction. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, How to Make Love is one of my favorites, but it's a very long poem. So I won't be able to read that one today. But I will read from Poems for the End of the World, um, which are, these are not, it's not a collection of poems about the end of the world. They're poems for the end of the world in all of the many ways that the world ends, right? So there are poems about the pandemic. There are poems about the environment. There are poems about heartbreak, right? Our world, it's the poems about grief. Our worlds end in a lot of ways and yet they keep beginning, right? And so that's really uh, sort of is the context of the collection. Um, so the first poem I'll read from this collection is uh, The Laughing Barrel Must Have Been Cobalt Blue, which is a tribute to my grandmother. Under the shadow of a headline, looking too much like our children, we tucked and folded and gathered ourselves and each other into the skirt of my grandmother's dining room tablecloth all of us lamenting and listing the labors and losses, the table spilling over with stories of the times the police were called or not called but came, the last jobs or second interviews, the neighbor or the grocery store clerk, the child at school and or their mother and or their father and or the teacher and the table listening, dipped in the center near to snapping under the burden until my grandmother emerged from the kitchen, apron speckled, but here is the thing, the real thing, her pointed fingers stern and scolding us into silence. Would any of you ever want to be anything other than what you are? And we sat, stunned, staring at ourselves until we began to laugh. And we laughed, we laughed into each other's shoulders. We laughed into howling, howled into howling until the moon herself walked into the room, staggering, crooked finger in the air, laughed her round face into our laughter, howling a perfect mirror, our moon eyes spilling and throaty, harmonious, looking and laughing and loving our rich and delicious lives, too perfect, too precious. And we ate to music, we ate without muting, our tears rolling into our open mouths. The next poem that I'll share is The Found Woman, which is after Lucille Clifton's The Lost Women. Uh, I know their names. Beloved and tender, these women I walk with. We gather each other bustling, bountiful skirt bottoms held together in fists, bounding upstairs, blistering with laughter, jauntily, jauntily, I know their names. Our soft arms swinging and crooked, hooked into each other's elbows, sweating, swapping stories. I have joined the tables of women who labor, who suck and chew the marrow, who laugh and joke into our beer, who rowdy howl in alleyways and gardens. We gang, we team, we laid proper now found and finding ourselves. We grow thicker every day. I know their names. Sticky, thunderous, chorus each other's days. Make our tables round with bounty. Sweep ghosts out of doors. Grease scalps, bring stew, make medicine, raise babies, gather ourselves and each other. I know our names. We salve salvation delicious. We ripe, round, juicy, bursting joy. We sharp arrows, straight aim. We women, we sistren, we laugh, we love ourselves and you. We found and finding each other. We still got plenty of room. And the next piece I'll share also from Poems for the End of the World is Ocotillo, which is a desert flower. When a seed is planted or buried, abandoned to the soil, it may not know this is a gift. Yes, this cry, wail, moan, Tear your hair and gnash your teeth, all of that, then wash the dishes. 
For much of the year, Ocotillo appears to be an arrangement of large, spiny, dead sticks. With rainfall, the plant becomes lush with green leaves. When water is scarce, the leaves turn brown and fall off. Every earth-cracked, thirsty yearning is a seed. Plant it. Let it crane toward the sun and bloom. Do seeds, the small ones, say mustard, get jealous or pray to become bigger seeds? Do they ever wish they could fill themselves up with air? Is that how they imagine growth? Sometimes I press my fingers toward the invitation of sky and say yes. Bend my face to the sun and laugh, remembering how I once clung to the shell I believed was me. With rain, we find Ocotillo swelling, blooming open into bloodshot flowers, earning it the name Desert Coral. Girl, braid your hair and wrap it up and go, even weeping if you must, somewhere the sun will touch your face. The hummingbird, migrating through the long desert, relies upon the flowers of the Ocotillo for honey nectar. Did you forget the kindness of wind and its longing for your skin? the unrepentant gaze of desert sky, the rivers that open their mouths to your sorrows, ready to carry them someplace you don't need to go. I reimagine myself daily. I abandon old wounds to the soil until they fertilize it. Everything, even waste, has a purpose. Ocotillo can grow up to 20 feet tall. Some say they live over a hundred years. Yes, sis, live. Let your bare feet sink into the mud. I have been afraid and filled with air before. Did not know I was a small, hard world becoming large as I unfold. And I will tell you, and I will tell me, I forget and forget my way. What is sweeter than longing for loose, escapable soil is to be rooted in rock, becoming honey on a tender tongue. And I'll close there, thank you. Rivers that open, our, uh, open their mouths and swallow our sorrows, I hope we all make such rivers and who will swallow our sorrows. Thank you, Suji. That was a haunting reading. Uh, I have, we have still have two minutes, so I'm going to use the time to ask you a quick question. This came out in June 2021 from Finishing Line, right? Yes, this it did. Collection. Yeah, so it's very recent experience of the world crumbling, our known infrastructure crumbling. So all of that has sunk into this, right? Yes. Yeah. I started writing this collection in 2019, actually, when the Amazon was on fire. Um, and that was my first major world ending. And a lot of things in my world were shifting at the same time. And so there was a lot of loss at that point, a lot of change, but also a lot of transition and new beginnings. And so there, all of those poems had that theme. And then I kept writing around that theme as the world just continued to unfold. Yeah. And, and even though these poems are so much about the destruction of the world as we know it, but they're also about hope and about, about survival and living on. You know, I also recently released my poetry collection in April and somebody asked me, why are you writing um, poems that are always a survivalist? And it was a genuine question. And I thought, I think, I think it's the only way we can be better ancestors, right? We also have to be good ancestors. We can't think, just think about our past and our own present. We have to think about the future. And I think you are doing the same thing by writing these poems. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a poem in there that is written to future descendants that is kind of telling the tale of our victory uh, from the future. Wow. <laughs> so that's yeah. also a piece that is there where I imagine myself being a very old woman telling, telling the young ones how we did it. We are writing our future as we imagine them, actually. I, I thank you so, so much, Uji. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come to Manuel right now. Uh, Manuel, I first read your work when I was an undergraduate in Delhi University. In fact, I wrote to you in 2007, I think, uh, hoping to work with you as an MFA student, or it was 2009, I don't, don't remember. And I, you were very gracious. Uh, and you answered all my questions. Eventually, I didn't apply to Arizona. But I got scholarship at a different university. I went there, and now I'm a creative writing professor. So you have your work had a great impact on my on my on my early early life. You know, so it's, it's a very special moment for me to be with you, even virtually here. Um, I don't, I'm not going to mandate where you want to read from. Please read from any anywhere you would like that. Yeah, but I I'm a great fan of your work. Well, thank you so much for saying that and, and also for reminding me that uh, sometimes we cross paths with people 
uh, long, 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 long ago, um, and you never know how we can reconvene. It's, it's very nice to be here with all of you today, um, here from Tucson, Arizona, but especially to be with poets. Uh, I absolutely agree with the writer Sandra Cisneros, who says that poetry is the pinnacle. Um, and she does, she does the whole range of what we can do on the page, but she has great respect for what, for what poetry can do. And, um, and I, I, I hope that you might be able to hear a little bit of, of how um, the attention to language and voice and detail um, has um, impacted my own work as primarily a short story writer. Um, I write about California's Central Valley which for those of you who are not familiar, it is far away from the glamor of Hollywood and LA or the contemporary um, you know, imagination we might have about uh, the Bay Area and tech. It is actually quite rural, working class and agricultural. Um, and, I, and I really write about my uh, various communities. It is Mexican American, um, those of us who, who grew up working in the fields, um, picking, uh, a whole array of crops, but also uh, the lives of queer young people who um, find themselves in a place like the valley and begin to ignite their own imaginations about where they want to go. Not all of my work um, involves, um, you know, those aspects. Sometimes they intersect. Um, but the story that I wanted to read from is from a story that came out in Best American a couple of years ago called um, anyone can do it. This is the Best American Edition 2019. And you might be able to hear from just the opening paragraphs um, some of the, of the, the, the storylines that will carry out in a collection that is coming out next year from Grey Wolf called The Consequences. This is Anyone Can Do It. Her immediate concern was money. It was a Friday when the men didn't come home from the fields and true. Sometimes the men wouldn't return until late. The headlights of the neighborhood work truck turning the corner, the men drunk and laughing from the bed of the pickup. And true, other women might have thought first about the green immigration vans prowling the fields and the orchards all around the valley, ready to take away the men they might not see again for days if good luck held, or even longer if they found no luck at all. When the street fell silent at dusk, the screen doors of the dark houses opened one by one, and the shadows of the women came to sit out on the concrete steps. Then Fina was one of them, but her worry was of a different sort. She didn't know these women yet, and these women didn't know her. She and her husband and her little boy had been in the neighborhood for only a month, renting a two-room house at the end of the street with a narrow screened in back porch, a tight bathroom with no insulation and a mildewed kitchen. There was only a dirt yard for the boy to play in and they had to drive into the town center to use the payphone to call back to Texas where Delfina was from. They had been here just long enough for Delfina's husband to be welcomed along to the, the field work, the pay split among all the neighborhood men, the work truck chugging away from the street before the sun even rose. When Delfina saw the first shadow rise in defeat, she thought of the private turmoil these other women felt in the absence of their men, and she knew that her own house held none of that. Just days before the end of June with the rent due soon, she thought that all the other women on the front steps might believe that nothing could be done, nothing could be any different until the men arrived, that nothing could change until they arrived from wherever they had been taken. She was alert to her own worry for sure, but she felt a resolve that seemed absent in the women putting out last cigarettes and retreating behind the screen doors. She watched as the street went dark past sundown and the neighborhood children were sent inside to bed. The longer she held her place on the front steps, the stronger she felt. From the far end of the street, one of the women emerged from a porch, and Delfina saw her moving along toward her house, guided by a few dim porch lights and the wan blur of a television set. When the woman, tall and slender, 
arrived at her front yard, that Vina could make out the long sleeves of a husband's work shirt and wisps of hair falling from her neighborhood, from her neighbor's bun. Buenas tardes, the woman said. Buenas tardes, the Fina answered. And rather than invite her forward, she rose from the steps and met her at the edge of the yard. Sometimes they don't come back right away, the neighbor said in Spanish. But don't worry, they'll come back soon, all of them. If they take them together, they come back together. I'll stop there. Thank you, Manuel. It's beautiful. Um, is it from the collection that will come on Beowulf next year? Yes, the consequence is coming from Grey Wolf in October. I'm actually editing the collection right now and getting it in order. Yeah, they're a great press based in Minnesota. I actually used to live in Minnesota before. So I really love Grey Wolf, Milkweeds, Coffee House, great presses out there in Minnesota. Yes, absolutely. We have two minutes. So I'm, I really want to ask you this quick question. I have many more questions for you, of course. You know, you have returned to the short story form once again with this collection. And in between, you took a, a break from the short story form and wrote the novel, uh, you know. Um, and when you were trying to publish your first collection, uh, which was published at Northwestern, I believe, and you faced a lot of challenges for the themes um, and for, for writing about an underrepresented community. Um, and then when you wrote the novel, um, you had to almost justify, right, that um, I, I have the uh, I have the capability and the, you know and the artistic ability to write this. I was just really, really curious about these different kinds of pressures that that I think we as um, queer writers of color face or writers from underrepresented cultures face. These are not questions I think for writers from privileged cultures. What do you think about that? And how does how do you how do you navigate these pressures and you know uh, and and expectations? Well, I have to say that one of the things that really uh, fascinates me and keeps me going with the short story is that it keeps offering me an opportunity to offer one more, one more uh, particular um, aspect, uh, insight, uh, picture of the valley and the community where I come from. And that's not to say that novels can't do it, but uh, you know, once you pick one particular storyline for a novel, you're there. Whereas collections offer you all sorts of opportunities to move around to different points of view, um, different, 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 um, even uh, status, uh, you know, who's, I've started to become a, a much more open to thinking about what does the farmer have to say about some of these stories. Um, um, writing increasingly about about women as in leaving them at the center of the story and honoring my um, my mother and my grandmother those are the people who raised me and thinking a lot about how that that um, that shapes the the experiences that so many of my characters go through um, so I, 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 I I'm I think I'm being bold enough to say I want to become a short story specialist from here on, but from here on, but we'll see. Um, you know, this, this collection took about nine years. And as everyone here knows, you know, once we start a new book, uh, we have to have a whole new cycle of how we think about what our next projects will be. We'll see what that will be. So when somebody asks you, where are you from? Do you still say you're from Fresno or do you say you're from Danuba? Oh, I say Fresno because even then people don't know Fresno uh, alone. But um, but yeah, it's it's. I am very proud of, of Dinuba. My family, my entire family is still there. Dinuba is a community that when I left was about twelve thousand people, and now it's becoming you know it's big thirty thousand. So, <laughs> um, but no, I, I it's it's home, it's home forever, uh, even if it, as it's changing. And I go back there quite a bit for sustenance. Um, and to remind myself um, of the place that I love so dearly and write about. I'm really hoping in a few years people say, I'm from Danuba, where Manuel Munoz is there. <laughs> and well, I, I, get, uh, I also get to say that about the, um, there's a Chicana painter named Esther Hernandez, who um, I encourage all of you to Google. If anyone knows the painting Sun Mad, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a sort of a picture of, of a, of a of the sun made raisin, but it's a, it's a skull instead. It's a commentary on the, the conditions that 
um, those of us in the Mexican American community went through, especially in the 70s and 80s with pesticides and so forth, um, and what we faced in order to sustain that industry. Um, we come from the same town for sure. Thank you, I'll look it up for sure. Um, I'm coming to Usha's poetry collection. It is a defined, you know, title. I will not fear his sons. And actually it reminds me of the, I mean, I'm from Northeast India, Assam. So uh, the languages I'm familiar with are Bengali or Hindi. And often I think Indian women are blessed by elders. May you be your sons <laughs> as if uh, women are only vehicles of, of you know, child um, uh, rearing or, or child childbirth. And this collection refuses to do and fit into the stereotypical role. And I think from the title itself, you establish the kind of politics and the vision that you have. Uh, so I was, I spent a wonderful day today post lunch reading your poems. And so thank you so much for writing the collection and over to you Usha and we are all looking forward to hear you. Thank you. Um, thank you JLF, thank you Aruni. Uh, thank you my co-panelists. I'm really grateful uh, to be here, very happy to be here. Um, I think I'll just start with the poems and you know that will uh, lead to the discussion um, and we'll just take it from there. Uh, I want to begin uh, with a poem called Unsought Pickings. Uh, the book is divided into two sections and the latter part of the book is dedicated to uh, women from all across the world. And Unsought Pickings is dedicated to uh, the African American slave women who was subjected to forced breeding. It was a very difficult uh, poem to write, but um, I felt I was duty bound um, uh, to, to, address, uh, to, to address this. The years between us are bald gossipium, clawed realities, spinning yarns, chilling truth, not yarn. Mandeville knew this was a beast sprouting plant our kutin, your cotton, their currency of carnage. I am told her pain is not yours to articulate, share or voice. Still I seek her in the blurred spirals of the feminine self, my hand seeking her palm as a mirror. Perhaps she imagines snowflakes to pick, snowflakes the white gold falling from the sky in the north. Instead her fingers start cotton like wasps, the destiny of her people hewed her body to a sickle seeking earth's arms more than sky. Did she think I'll be picking cotton till the sun is a hole in the lament soaked sky of waning blues? Perhaps. Did she seek answers in the liminal spaces of unsought pickings blooming like soft cotton? Better the cotton picking than the wedding between the cows and the bulls, than the decree from dank walls, than the brooding air of muffled suffering, than the damp wet cave of smothered pain, than fingers and pubescence prying her open like a can, than the unwilling rabbit of her private to his, better numbing labor than the pinioning of air pressing as a bale of hay, the straw filling her mouth, throat, lungs, her eyes sweeping the air like bats, outside the sullen crushed sympathy like lifeless cotton with hardened seeds, ears dialed to deafness for survival, better her hands furrowed and perforated, better her palms fissured with ancestral pain, did the moments of anger pile on stone by stone to sift between unsought pickings? Be a breeding woman then be fettered to a whipping post? This better than a back striped like a field, red petals of welts blooming to the sun, a waste of dandelions around her, drooping in shame, staining her memory's notebook of incoherent rage, a rage alive, breathing like cotton. The, the second one is called um, They Cannot Persist in the Sunlit Room and this poems are dedicated to Sylvia Plath. Suddenly I know I am not Sylvia. I persist in the dark foliage of life and if not snow, blood on snow, I live. 
My pages are not mausoleums or Ouija boards, walking tours among tombstones where spirits mourn, every poem a medallion of madness I live inside another compass. Not words of flint, steel, iron, the soul's vomit. Sentence veins with poisoned blood, fissured stanzas, hackered rhyme. Poem whirl, poem numb, hyphenated madness. Never will I create a dark sky glittering with cancerous constellations. This I gladly confess, like syllable stressed, as in I know I am not Sylvia. Even though I've dipped my nib in the dark ink of her well, and know the magic of incantation, for the repetition of blue-throated names runs in my blue veins, and use the odd metaphor, I am not Sylvia when I use my pen. I've been a woman sobbing on my bathroom floor. I've seen the souls shine, ebb and die. I've hoped on many days I could quietly fly, and my mind's buzzed with a swarm of bees, a chromosomatic mess. I've been a hanging woman, from a noose of an ancient culture daily demeaned, and the voices like a flock of vultures. I'll tell you an open secret. Women pluck other women's bones clean. Still, I'm not Sylvia. I've walked to the edge of a river in my mind many times, filled my pocket with stone-heavy poems, and the river returned my face as Medusa, and the dark water streamed upward, a trishulam to the sky, and I heard a black goddess command, live. I am sane as rice on banana leaves, the alphabet engraved on skull. And even though my mind is not steady as the hull of a ship and the world like a pack of thieves conspires to take my life, only a muslin sail in the wind, I will not behead myself. A self sieved painfully through the mesh of this life, I live. Don't know, do I have time for one more? We up with time. Yes, three okay. minutes left, please, if you want to read. Okay, um, all right. Um, okay, the last, last poem I'm going to read is called Rise, and this was dedicated to uh, the Turkish women immigrants at the local raindrop center here in Austin. The air has the color of courage. The table waits like a country to be taken. The room is a manuscript of many languages. The spices of new names and ingredients flounce their skirts, toss their heads and make grand entrances. Borek, Aik Churegi, Lamachun, Sumak, Penirli Pogacha, Kalpur Basti. In the womb of round bottom glasses, honey-colored chai serenely asks, where do we come from? How are we here? Who are we? Quietly, the flower waits, the modest mistress of them all, her age unknown, old crone of eons, her cheeks are unblemished. I'm going to make the most powerful food, Saltic says, smile warm as the inside of an oven. She's in charge and her mother or grandmother singing ancient chants and hushed lullabies, speaking the language of bread through her. Soon the woman's fingers, like tapping heels, dances in a row, heads bobbing like Valentine bouquets. Like pianists, they tap, tap and fly. Like drummers, they pound. They make the flowers sing like mermaids to a shore. They cajole, plead, pound, reap and meet, tease and toss. The flower surrenders. These fingers know, yes they know, wordless secrets flow. In this room where people slip in and out of the fingers of many countries, the air watches as water with a silent toe. The fingers glow with the secrets of what makes things rise, what makes things live, what can quench our thirsts and hungers, the things women know that pass down quietly through the blood century upon century, as if they know that time too is like this, flaky fillow sheets. A life in the end is what happens between the layers, where what we fill it with, the appetite with which we bake it, makes it rise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We are we are getting questions from the audience, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to abuse my power of the moderator and ask my question first. Uh, Usha, because you read last, um, and maybe I can start with you and I'll move to Suji and then to Manuel. Um, Usha, this poetry collection obviously imagines a global solidarity uh, from your viewpoint for women across cultures, across time, 
um, um, and across the globe. Um, um, but at the same time, this is also tinged with your sensibility as a woman who speaks Telugu, if I'm not wrong, uh, and also for a woman, a woman from India and, uh, and an immigrant woman who lives in Texas. How do you sort of blend all of this together? And, 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 and what was your sort of you know, uh, initial inspiration for this collection? Because this is a pretty expansive and ambitious project. Uh, and also to maintain the defined streak across the poems uh, was probably challenging as well. Um, I think there are a lot of questions there. Um, uh, basically, I think the, the book was many years in the making and um, began to solidify around 2016, 2018, when I was writing my poetry uh, thesis at, at Cambridge, the second year of, of my master's there. And uh, that's when I, it began to take shape as a manuscript. and because it was under because it had to evolve from this overall issue of women's issues um there, there were many uh, i think just so many issues began to intersect so while i had to make um and adhere and and acknowledge that there are many feminisms um i also wanted to break down boundary boundaries so the first section of the book is um is about myself they're more personal experiences and just kind of you know gen generalized poems and the Second section of the book pays uh, homage and salutes a number of women across the globe because I felt at some point, though there are many feminisms, though there are there are there's there's kind of individualized flavor to the fight. Um, in the end, I really think th the problem on this planet is there've been two castes forever. It's men and women. I think I think that has been the primary. Uh, primary battle going on uh, for just really centuries. And I wanted something hopeful. And I think um, I wanted to look at globalism in a positive way. And I think all women are united in, in, in whatever our fights are. And so that was kind of the statement I was trying to make with that book. And I, I do address all those things that you talked about, Arun. There are, there are issues of immigration, um, being a woman, uh, and just, just so many so many layers to the thing. Um, and I tried, you know, so uh, that's kind of the, the birth of that book. Thank you so much. I'm going to move to Suji. We also have a question from audience from Emma, uh, who says that for Suji, can you tell us how performance poetry has evolved over the years and in what directions do you currently see it heading? I think people are also tagging, uh, clumping multiple questions together, just like me, because we have so much for you. What I really wanted to ask along with that question <laughs> is that uh, uh, your activism and your uh, protest for um, for, the, for civil rights, you know, and demand for civil rights, it definitely influences your poem. So just putting these two questions together, performance, how do you, how do you sort of write and create performance poetry uh, and also, uh, also sort of marry your uh, activist life with it? I think all of them are born from the same place for me. I'm a deeply feeling person, which leads me to write, which leads me to speak, which leads me to act. Um, and that has always been true. And so they're not separate for me. Um, I believe that poetry is an oral language, has always been an oral language. And so it should be spoken aloud. It is meant to be read aloud. Um, I, love, I love the page as well. Um, there are a lot of things that I like to experiment with on the page that are complicated to do um, out loud. So I do a lot of different things with that, but I think ultimately the goal is to um, find and express that truth and connect it to an audience. And so uh, ideally, sometimes the audience is just me and that's okay too. I'm an audience and that's fine. <laughs> but, um, and I might be my most important audience truly, right? I need to write the thing that is gonna keep me alive. And so that is the, the most urgent and pressing thing when it comes to triaging. Um, but I think that, again, I'm a, I'm a deeply feeling person and all of that has to exist in the same body. And if I didn't express it, I would explode. So it's also, it's also selfish in the self-preservation, right? Um, it keeps me alive. Thank you, Suji. I'm gonna to come to Manuel right now. Uh, Miso asks, and I, I really wanted to ask many questions, but this is really a wonderful question as well. Sensuality is a major theme in your book but there is more, more going on than kissing. There is coming of age, there is experience confronting inexperience, there is learning, there is shame. What interests you about sensuality and how do you approach it in writing? I, I have to say just my immediate answer to that is uh, shame really, because it, it has to do, I think a bit with 
how um, how that shapes one when when one grows up in a place like the valley, which I didn't mention before, but you can probably guess in a in a rural agricultural working class place, it's extraordinarily conservative. Um, and you know, as 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 a young person, you know, coming to terms with uh, who I was and who I wanted to be, also, you know, put me through some experiences that um, that um, I, I needed some time and distance to to understand and to also think about and reflect uh, before. I don't want to say before I put them on the page, but to think about what it was that I wanted put on the page. Um, and that's why shame, I think, is so extraordinary in that way. I mean, it is an aspect of what sensuality is about. And there's there's absolutely room to be celebratory, um, um, positive, and so forth. But um, the damage that shame can cause and, um, um, you know, the, the da damage is the word, the, the damage and the trauma that shame can cause, I think, is, is also the thing that really gets me to think about, um, you know, how, how much more effective or powerful my narratives can be. Manuel, your new collection, because um, it is coming out in 2022, can you quickly tell us what, what is the unifying theme, if there is at all, uh, these short stories, what are, they what are you trying to achieve artistically um, and as, uh, through, this, through this collection? I have to say, I've been, I've been, I've been telling um, several people that they, I call them the deportation stories, um, because about five years ago, my father had a stroke, and uh, in in helping to take care of him along with my mother, I started to hear a whole lot of stories that I'd never heard from either one of them about how he um, was often deported and, and taken over back to Mexico. Um, and how he and my mother managed to keep our family unit together. Um, and a lot of the silent work that she had to do um, that I never knew about um, and the intricacies, the complexities, the struggles that she went through uh, to get him back to the States. Um, and that to me was just a whole new aspect of, um, you know, some, I don't wanna say I had been missing in my stories before, but uh, sometimes they were just simply centered around me, my experience as a young person thinking about my father who's gone away, as opposed to um, the, works, the work that the adults had to do, um, you know, to face that crisis. Um, so many of those stories involve, um, involve that struggle and that time period. Um, not, it's yeah, not entirely too. there, but you'll, I think you can hear a little bit in, in that excerpt that I shared. I think that that can change someone to live with that perennial anxiety and tension of being deported. It's it's this kind of changes one's DNA probably. And uh, we are really looking forward to read your collection. Definitely me. I'm going to pick it up. Um, uh, Suji and Usha, uh, there are questions. There, this, this is a question for everyone actually, but I'm going to address to the both of you. We've two, we have two minutes, so if, if you could quickly say, how has the pandemic? This is Chloe who has asked. How has the pandemic changed your way of writing or what you plan on writing next? And we'll end it after that. Um, I'll quickly answer that and say, uh, culturally, I don't think the, the pandemic made too much of difference for me as a writer because uh, my life is fairly solitary. And uh, I think that just seems to be the nature of a writer's life. Um, in terms of what I'm doing next, um, I'm looking forward, I'm writing a book with a Romanian poet, we're co-writing a book. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, a, a poem picture book that should come out next year. Um, and uh, an anthology of uh, poems about Hyderabad by Hyderabad poets was a collection I edited last year and uh, where we're looking for the publisher for it. So that in a nutshell, I think answers both your questions and I think over to Susie now. Yeah. Susie, you have written an entire collection, so maybe uh, you can talk about what is your next project. So yes, I have spent, I uh, released two collections this year actually, <laughs> and, but one was written well before, so it was very delayed by the pandemic. And so I didn't plan for them both to come out in 2021, but here we are. Um, I've spent a lot of my time in the pandemic actually teaching, and I've been teaching more than I've been Right. I've been writing, but I, I think I'm planning now to ideally start really looking at the writing that I've done in the last year and a half and start editing for the next collection. So that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, I think we have come to an end 
of the program, uh, I really could ask all of you many, many more questions. I, I'm, I'm really sad that this conversation is coming to an end. It, yeah, I wish it was two hours, but that's, but that's me. You know, I, I don't I, I don't know if all of you feel the same way, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and beautifully answering all of these. And it's wonderful to meet each one of you virtually and also the people at JLF who I have known for a very long time. Suraj, over to you. Thank you, Aruni. Absolutely. We could have all heard, uh, listened to the conversation forever, but looking at the paucity of time, we had to stop. So apologies for that. But thank you, Usha, Manuel, Susie, and Aruni for an amazing session and for those wonderful readings. Aruni, as you mentioned in the beginning, yes, we wish we could have done this, uh, this in person at the lovely Boulder Public Library, but hopefully in 2022. But thank you so much for being part of JLF Colorado 2021 virtual series. It's never easy to put up a festival together, may it be on ground or virtual. Many individuals and organizations come together to make it happen. So on behalf of all my colleagues at JLF Colorado and Team of Arts, I would like to thank a number of people who made JLF Colorado 2021 possible. To start with, our wonderful festival co-directors, Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, for putting their heart and soul in this and curating this wonderful program. Our fantastic speakers who have joined us from across the globe and created this magical content. Our lovely partners, Boulder Public Library and City of Boulder, who have always stood by us, even against the odds. Thank you, David, Kathy, Aspen, Annie, and the entire team of BPL. We hope next year we are present in person for the festival at the beautiful Boulder Public Library. Our wonderful board of directors and advisory board of JLF Colorado, thank you so much for your faith and belief in us and uh, in the festival. To all our supporters, sponsors, donors, patrons, and friends of the festival, we can't even tell you how fortunate we feel to receive all the warmth and love from you all. Thank you. And of course, my lovely colleagues who have worked day and night to make this happen. Sanjoy, Jesse, Anubhav, Sapna, Neha, Sharupa, Samohan, Archan, Pinky, Srishti, Satyam, Maya, and the entire team. And above all, you. You are the reason we create festivals for. Without you, we are nothing. So thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. And thank you for being part of the journey. We do look forward to welcoming you again virtually in our upcoming programs, JLF Houston and JLF New York, which is on October 16th and 17th and 20th, respectively. You can register and watch free sessions on our website, which are www.jlflitfest.org slash Houston and www.jlflitfest slash New York. Thank you once again and see you soon. Festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh. Uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions.
sense to me, religion and art are the same thing. They're vaguely irrational, but they help make sense of things. Someone who lives with no art and no religion has very little to live on. 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. You have to think of viruses as intelligent machines, as code crackers. And like all living forms, they have to adapt to their environment. Imagination is a powerful tool. It doesn't matter which part of the world we are in our situation. Are we behind locked bars? Are we roaming freely? Independent thought and process. Our imagination allows us to soar out of any present circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that really is the power of literature and the written word. It allows us to envision a better future. It allows us to consider our past and make sense of the present. Imagination is a tool to be able to free us from the binds and the constrictions that we find ourselves locked into. We can break free. We can soar through the universe. We can rise up into the darkened night like a firefly, illuminating the world. This is what JLF Golden Colorado hopes to bring you. Something to fire your imagination.